Why is it that before the general election, regardless of how much we owe, each party can find billions of dollars to entice the general public to vote for their party? Barnaby Joyce, let me ask, let me go to you first on that one. Well, what we've got to do is make sure that we earn the money. If you want to spend the money, you've got to earn the money. And I suppose my portfolio is going to the parts of our nation where we earn money. And the first rule of being an accountant is if you're making money in the Pilbara, then you should invest more money in the Pilbara. If we're making money out of our agricultural sector, remembering eight out of our 10 biggest exports, and look at everything you're wearing that's imported, the clothes, the car you drive, the fuel you use, the television you watch, it's all imported. Somebody somewhere has to put something on a boat and send it in the other direction. So we do spend money because we invest in those areas so that we can get our nation into a stronger position, as strong as possible, as quickly as possible. And a lot of the circumstances are before us as well. Uh, you've all seen um, President, uh, Prime Minister Sokovare and President Xi Jinping shaking hands in the Solomons. They're going to build a naval base there. And you see what's happening in the Ukraine. And we have, we have a, a completely different circumstances that are before us. So we've got to invest to make our nation strong. And we have to earn money. And in some areas, we've got to invest to earn money so that we have the capacity to pay for all the things that are so evident in any of the discussions that are happening by the Prime Minister or the Leader of the Opposition. So, um, and also, running a government is a very expensive thing. Well, and uh, Barnaby, let, me, let me jump in there, Barnaby Joyce. There are some things in this budget that you yourself have argued against. A couple of weeks ago, you said a fuel excise cut wouldn't be a good idea. It wouldn't help cost of living. It would just take money away from roads. So why is that now a good idea? Well, because we're going to maintain our funding in roads. Uh, it's vitally important. It's an incredibly important piece of infrastructure for our nation. Uh, I think that a lot of the issues that, you know, obviously the collegiate, the cabinet's a collegiate process. And you'll you win some, you lose some. In everything you do, in, everything, in every part of life, isn't that the case? In this one you lost? Uh, no, I don't think it's a case of losing it. As you also know <laughs> with cabinet, the decision of one is the decision of all. And, um, and that's, uh, you know, I just want to make sure that we clearly understand the pressures that are coming on us. The reason fuel's going through the roof is 40% uh, of Europe's fuel requirements, energy requirements come out of Russia through the Ukraine. It's an incredible restriction on supply. It's forcing up prices. It won't just do it to fuel, it'll be doing it to food because 30% of the world's grain, yeah. barley and wheat come out of Ukraine and, and the western part of Russia. This is going to have yeah. massive effects oh, on our nation all, and how the globe works. We're all noticing that. Jackie Lambie, let me ask, ask you, would you actually like to see government spending more than it is in this budget? No, what I'd like to see is our money being a, a lot better targeted. That's what I'd like to see. I mean, I mean, if you use JobKeeper as an example, it was great and it helped many people out there, that, but there was many corporate companies that ended up making massive profits and keeping what we gave them and they didn't actually need that money. That is not well targeted. Um, that is a problem. You know, we're about next year or after this financial year, some of the lowest come income earners, or all of them, are actually going to be paying a little bit more tax. Yet in 2024-25, those st stage three tax cuts for anybody earning over $200,000 is going to get a nice big tax cut of $9,000. Let's be realistic up here. I have yet to hear from either side that they've got the guts to pull the plug on the stage three tax cuts. And that is what needs to be done. And sometimes it takes courage. And where you lose votes, you will gain them with respect from others. And it's time to make some dis tough decisions and it's time to hit those big people who are already on enough money in this country and make sure the ones down the bottom, us, we can sustain their living. That is what needs to be done. <laughs> Zali Stegall, uh, Jackie Lambie has suggested where you could uh, find some savings, not proceeding with the stage three tax cuts. What about you? Are there areas, just coming back to Jean's question, this money that gets spent before an election, are there areas we, where you think that there's been wasteful spending in this budget? Um, uh, there is, but I'd like to first come back to Jean's question, which I think is incredibly important because here we are after three years of ignoring a lot of the needs that the community are calling for from the government. You get these, this just avalanche of promises come election time and all this spending um, to basically get your vote. But there really isn't the follow through. And I think that's the frustration and the lack of trust in government because all these promises are 
are made, but very little is delivered. Um, I think, yes, there, is, there was an absolute sweetener uh, in this budget. We're talking $3 billion on that excise pay uh, cut to fuel, for example. I mean, that... Are you, are you opposed to that? Uh, look, I just don't think it's wise spending. It's not, uh, it's across the board. I am not confident that it's going to be passed on in full to consumers because we have very fluctuating fuel prices. It will be incredibly hard to regulate. I think like JobKeeper, it will probably result in, in not a, f a very effective way of helping people. If you, if you compare it, three, it's $3 billion to our bottom line. For that, you could be assisting a huge amount of households to reduce their power bills. You could have you know, solar panels on roofs for low-income earners, and they could save up to $1,000 a year on their energy costs. So there are such more effective ways of helping people with the cost of living. Jim Chalmers, Labor, did back the fuel excise cut and the other cost of living benefits in the budget. Tonight, Anthony Albanese, in his budget replies, also uh, announced further a boost in aged care services that I think is worth, you can correct me if I'm wrong, is it an extra two and a half it billion is. dollars? It is. Uh, so, look, well, uh, tell us, um, is, is this also, as Jean suggests, mm. a, a pre-election spending measure? No, of course not. And I think what Jean asked, what Zali said about trust and what Jackie said about waste really get, to get us closer to the nub of the issue here. Uh, yes, a lot of people are concerned that we don't have enough to show for the trillion dollars in debt that is in the budget that future generations will have to pay off. But I think their primary concern is really about whether we're getting value for money for all that money that's being borrowed. Jackie's right that there has been tens of billions of dollars wasted in the budget, which would have been better off invested in a better future for the economy or to provide genuine cost of living relief for people. So our issue, uh, the quantity of the spending matters, but the quality of the spending matters as well. And that's why I'm really proud uh, with the announcement that Anthony Albanese just made a short time ago to put the care back into aged care. The aged care system is in crisis. It's hard to imagine a better use of $2.5 billion of taxpayers' money than to make sure that we've got nurses in aged care 24-7, that we've got the right amount of care minutes, that people are getting decent food, that workers are getting decent pay, and that we've got transparency and accountability so that we can do the right thing by older Australians in our community. And if a 25% pay rise is recommended by the umpire for those aged care workers, Labor will pay for that? Well, the reality is that whatever the Fair Work Commission decides about aged care workers, I think they're going to make their decision later this year, a government of either political persuasion will have to fund that. The Prime Minister's made that point. The difference is, as Anthony Albanese said today, we enthusiastically support uh, a pay rise for aged care workers. A lot of aged care workers earn $22 or $23 an hour to do one of the most important jobs that we have in our entire community, look after older and more vulnerable Australians. And we don't think that's right. The next step is the Fair Work Commission. They will nominate a pay rise and they will nominate a time frame. And whoever wins the election in May will have to fund that increase in pay. Paul Kelly, let me, and again, coming back to Jean's question, it's about the sort of pre-election spending that we see. At the end of this budget week, we've heard from both sides now, how do they compare? Who is being more responsible, do you think? Well, I think we've seen a fascinating situation this week, David, with two very different economic presentations. Tonight, from Anthony Albanese, we saw a personal manifesto. We saw him speaking from the heart, filled with emotion, about the sort of economy he wants. And he made clear he wants an economy that cares about people. He wants an economy that puts people centre stage. So he's talking about the lived experience of the Australian people when it comes to the economy. He's talking about wages, aged care accommodation and childcare. Now on Tuesday night, we saw a very different presentation. We saw Josh Frydenberg deliver a pre-election budget. And that budget showed strong economic recovery, very good numbers, um, a great surge in jobs, uh, a very significant improvement in terms of the bottom line. But he was talking about the macro economy, and the macro economy looks very good. But the problem for the government is how people feel about the economy. The problem for the government is the lived experience of the people. So essentially, what you've got here is you've got the government talking about and documenting the economic recovery, and you've got the Labor Party talking more about 
the people and having an economy that's people-centred. Is, he, is either one more responsible, though, given where the economy's at and what the people need? I thought that the budget on Tuesday night was responsible, and all you've got to do is follow the numbers. So if you look at the increase in revenue over the forward estimates, about 70% of that went to improve the budget bottom line. That is an extra $100 billion, reducing the deficit over five years. About 30% or a bit under went in tax and spend. That is, went in government decisions in the context of the election. So what that shows is it, it, uh, it uh, shows a budget geared to both the politics and the economics. But Frydenberg knew he had to get a much better bottom line, and he did.